a moment, he thinks of Hiroshima. And the toy casts over Elm Street a thin shadow of dread. What might happen here is on Joe Griffith's mind because his job as commander at a local Nike site is to help turn the shadow of dread which hangs over us all into a shield that will protect us all. This shield is a system of men and machines called Nike Hercules, which very simply consists of detection and guidance elements located on the ground. Three eyes connected by electronic brain cells and nerves across several thousand yards to sharp winged fists. The fists can strike fast and high and they contain a small new atomic device which can safely defend us against fleets of high-flying bombers carrying atomic weapons. But the fists alone are not weapons. They are only part of a weapons system which coordinates missile, radar, and ground guidance to find, follow, and destroy the enemy. Inside a steel skull nearby, an electronic brain receives information night and day. One radar eye searches and finds the enemy and reports his position. Then another radar turns and seizes upon the target, following it as it approaches and reporting its every maneuver to the computer, while a third radar tells the missile what to do. At the proper moment, the battery commander gives the order to fire. As the missile flies, the computer guides it, and if the target tries to get away, changes the missile's course and commands the target's destruction. Protecting a large sector of sky at this Nike battery is the responsibility of Captain Griffith, who is supported by an interlocking series of human relationships. Civilian field engineers and Army ordnance officers are familiar visitors at Nike sites. Operational information is constantly being exchanged between designers, manufacturers, and the users of this new system. A system developed to extend our defensive shield and to include an atomic punch. Hercules was designed to fit into America's permanent defense in depth, which begins with the dew line and further south, the Mid-Canada Line. Both are backed up in the United States and Canada by other radar bases and along the nation's coasts by specially equipped aircraft and picket ships. The first line of action is fighter aircraft. And the last, Nike batteries, which guard American factories, cities, and retaliatory bases. In an interlocking circle, of defense rings. Forming a defensive shield. And who is to hang this shield? The United States Army Ordnance Missile Command assigned the project to the Bell Telephone System, to its research and manufacturing arms, Bell Laboratories, and Western Electric who selected Douglas Aircraft to work with them. These same partners had already made the Nike Ajax systems, now so widely deployed. They were to use many ideas and much equipment from Ajax in producing a new missile big enough to carry the secret atomic device, outlined here as a red cylinder, which could destroy a whole fleet of planes at a blow. The weapon the engineers were asked to design must fly very high and very fast, yet it would not be shaped by performance alone. It 
it must also be as simple as possible to make, so that it would be ready to defend us before new enemy planes were ready to attack, and as easy as possible to carry and install and fire in every climate, so that our army could use its high, fast trajectory and its deadly striking power wherever it might fight. But how is a man to surmount these problems? Only by mounting the broad shoulders of men who have come before him. So the engineers turned first to Faraday and Rayleigh and other pioneer physicists like Maxwell, Heaviside and Hertz, and the more recent work of their own colleagues. Only in the towering achievements in the pages of the past would they find the stature a man needs to see off into the future. The first step into the future was taken at the Bell Telephone Laboratories, where electronic equipment could simulate a battle between a plane of the future and a defensive missile system of the future. The direction and performance of both target and weapon were stored in electronic brains. So were the ways in which a bomber pilot might suddenly twist and turn at supersonic speed in a program of evasive tactics. Now the battle between missile and aircraft was launched and the whole sky reduced electronically to a sheet of paper. If the missile failed to intercept the target and the simulated battle for North America were lost, the dials could spin out a second chance. As the months passed, the new thin red line of our nation's defense took on a more solid shape in testing grounds across the country. The Army rocket and guided missile agencies facilities at Redstone Arsenal echoed with the power of the new Hercules motor. Not long after, in deepest secrecy at the White Sands Missile Range, part of the U.S. Army Missile Command in a desert in New Mexico, the first experimental model of Nike Hercules was assembled. Project Command, this is Army Blockhouse. Go ahead, Blockhouse. Our missile preparations are complete. Roger, all looks well here. Complete your safety inspection. To the engineers from across the country who had gathered here at White Sands for the tests, the flight of this first missile would be more than an attempt to vault across space. It would be a journey through the wide expanding world of modern mathematics and physics. When the safety engineer had made sure the area was clear, they would put to the test not only steel and instruments, but ideas, formulae, months of calculations. The area is all clear. As design and manufacturing ears and military experts watched the rising track of the missile toward its target on the right, the full story of the experimental flight, which they would later study from many different points of view, was being recorded electronically to the last split second.
after each of many firings, photographic memories added their total recall of the flight to electronic records. This comparison of the missile's response in flight to guidance commands from the ground showed the first experimental models of Nike Hercules had proven themselves. But graphs and formulae are not enough. You must turn to the faces of people. Men like Captain Griffith, who operated the successful Nike Ajax batteries, and civilian field engineers, who shared their daily routine with Ajax, day in, day out, in every climate, at every Nike site. Their experience helped shape the equipment the new system would require, helped solve many problems in human engineering, verified that Nike Hercules could be used as planned by soldiers who were not engineers. The Nike Hercules prototype battery, one of the first systems off the production lines, was assembled for tests at White Sands Missile Range. Would the performance of factory-made equipment meet the standards set by the experimental model? Engineers met to plan an exhaustive test program to evaluate this prototype. Regular staff meetings were set up. A system of priorities was established to make the required tests in a logical sequence. For the first time, the military was introduced to Hercules hardware. There was much to explain and much to learn. So for six months, civilian engineers and military personnel lived on the missile range, methodically, systematically checking out the Nike Hercules prototype. Men who had written operational manuals in New Jersey could now compare notes at White Sands with the men who would use and maintain the intricate electronic equipment. Were the manuals clear and concise? Did they contain information needed to operate Nike Hercules at peak efficiency? The new system also included a new missile. Preparation techniques were checked and evaluated under the watchful eyes of engineers. Missile technicians ran through the checklist to see that the missile was ready to fly. It would fly from a launcher, which could be installed quickly, easily. The missile would lift from its launcher with the aid of a powerful booster. When booster and missile were joined, the missile would be ready for flight, ready to receive guidance to its target. Time spent in the prototype area was time saved in the production schedule. Modifications suggested by this experience were quickly incorporated by Western electric engineers to produce in quantity the delicate nerves and brains of Nike Hercules. There were many problems in manufacturing the complex new missile system. One was to make sure by careful tests that the many intricate parts of the system always worked properly when assembled together. Another problem, less obvious than lining up instruments against a radar beacon, was to line them up against the irrevocable schedule of America's defense. The making of the guidance system had to be synchronized with the work of hundreds of other businesses, from specialized workshops to the assembly lines of Douglas Aircraft where the muscles and sinews of the new Hercules were taking shape. In every plant, engineers mustered their every skill to make all the mechanical and electronic components of the system ready at the right time and place. Yet machinery, however punctually assembled and stockpiled for delivery, was only part of Nike Hercules. Useless without the other greater part, the missile men.
To the Army Air Defense Center at Fort Bliss, Texas, came students to master their own particular jobs in the new system. At first, all seemed deceptively simple. They learned that Nike Hercules is a guided missile, guided by commands from a control center on the ground. That the parts of each missile would come to them almost ready to fly. They would simply put them together in an assembly area and then store them in underground launchers, side by side with smaller Ajax missiles. As the men studied, so did their officers. Each officer, like Captain Griffith, would have to know in detail how the entire system works, how it decides where the enemy is, chooses a missile, fires it, guides it. Captain Griffith learned that he would always share the specialized knowledge of civilian and military experts, but that he could never share the responsibility for making the system work. He must possess and instill in his men the special rigorous discipline of the intellect which modern war requires. Some men, future guidance specialists, began to fix in their minds a clear picture of how invisible electronic impulses guide the missile. There was so much to understand and remember that at first it seemed impossible to grasp it all. These youthful guidance technicians, used to looking at things with their own eyes, had to learn to use the radar eyes which modern war demands. Soon these men would gain confidence in the use of their strange instruments which need neither sun nor searchlight to see by. Other men became launcher specialists, crewmen who would know how to keep the missiles continually ready to fire. As the weeks passed, the impossible became merely difficult, and then easy, and then second nature. Finally, these soldier technicians and officers assembled for the first time to form Nike Hercules batteries. Captain Griffith assumed command of men with skills which had taken many weeks to develop. Now it was his job to weld together the two parts of the system, the men and the machines. As the machines arrived at Fort Bliss, they too were assembled into batteries. The eyes, brains, and fists were brought together for the first time by Western Electric engineers. With Army Ordnance experts, they checked everything, and now they placed each battery, together with a detailed record of how its parts functioned, a profile of its electronic personality, into the hands of the men who would use it. Here was the equipment Captain Griffith and his men would work with and live with from now on, and would take with them to the Nike Hercules base in their home community. As the battery trained, the central theme was safety. Electronic devices prevented accidental firings, but many additional precautions were taken. Red streamers were attached to parts which made the missile unable to fire. Yet even when the parts with streamers were removed, it would take a set of special keys to the awesome power of the missile system. When safety precautions had become second nature to every man, it was time for Captain Griffith to lead his battery on the journey to McGregor Range, a few miles away in New Mexico. Across terrain upon which had been written many a chapter in the history of the United States. Much had changed since the cavalrymen unhitched their wagons here long ago. The 
centuries of today, instead of looking out over a few miles of terrain for men on horseback, looked up across a battleground wide as the sky, searching out an enemy faster than sound. The soldiers and the trailers were preparing not for a skirmish, but for a battle for survival. And the carbines of old had taken strange and new shapes. But though much had changed, the traditions of the United States Army remained all along the firing line at McGregor. Range officers controlled the firing of the many Hercules batteries, men like Captain Griffiths, who had come here for their baptism of fire, the test of their ability to operate Nike Hercules. Battle stations, blue status, Acquisition present. Computer present. TTR present. NTR present. Blue status received in the launching area. Launch platoon present. On deck. Now Nike Hercules was ready to engage a mock enemy, a remotely controlled plane from a distant airfield. Search. The searching radar swept the skies for the unseen target. Challenge target. Is it friend or foe? No IFF. Target foe. Designate. The eye of the tracking radar swung to the target and from now on would follow its every movement. Target. Presently, all would be automatic. Automatic. All the powers of decision of all those who had shaped the missile system, from Faraday down to the most junior crewmen, would be withdrawn as electronic hands took over. Launcher number one ready. Stand clear. Launcher number one. This is what it would be like near our great cities and with the army overseas if on some awful day the enemy attacked in earnest. On the range, an inexpensive drone target simulated the enemy aircraft. This would be a dress rehearsal of what would happen if an enemy were to unleash the terrible heat and destruction of nuclear war. Only when the final careful details were complete would the safety keys release the readied missile to the radar waiting to guide it in its flight. Now there was only time enough left for the final finger exercises. When the warning lights would switch to green, the missile would be ready to fire. Launching control group ready for action. Acquisition ready for red status. Computer ready for red status. TTR ready for red status. MTR ready for red status. Red status. Section A selected. The missile radar pivoted toward the launching area and cast on the missile the electronic beam which would guide it in its flight. Site 23, request clearance to fire. Surveillance, this is the range safety officer. Is the range radar clear? The range is radar clear. Site 23, you have final clearance to fire. In split seconds, the missile, armed with high explosive, would act out the role that can also speak with the awful voice of nuclear war. About to fire. Five, four, three, two, one. Fire.
40 seconds to intercept. Thirty seconds to intercept. They could only wait and watch and listen to the heartbeat of a nation's survival. Twenty seconds to intercept. Five, four, three, two, one. Site 2-3, firing successful. Elm Street dons the peaceful cloak of evening and prepares for another night of rest. But these eyes are never closed. Men and machines are now one. Nike Hercules is our assurance that what might happen will not happen here. <laughs>